uh, if you got your Bible, uh, we'll turn to the exciting book of Numbers tonight. Numbers chapter number 6. So uh, I know that's where everybody wanted to go. Numbers chapter number 6. And uh, we'll be starting in verse number 1 tonight. We'll just read these six verses and then we'll get into the message. And uh, so the title of the message you can see it up on, on the screen uh, says the covenant sacrifice. And so right here in Numbers chapter number 6, uh, what we find taking place is there's some instruction being given. And uh, during the, the time of Moses' life, God put out a lot of instruction through Moses. God spoke directly to Moses and then Moses would present um, all these political laws and all these different things that took place for the children of Israel as they come out of Egypt, and it established the groundwork for the way they lived for quite some time. And uh, so these things were important, and uh, some of these things were very heavy matters. And uh, this is one of the more heavy things that I guess God put out there for the children of Israel to do. And so the the uh, vow of a Nazarite, there's only just, uh, I don't know, maybe five people that I know of in the Bible that ever uh, was committed to that vow. And um, Samson is probably the most popular one that you, know, that you know of, that he had a vow that he was committed to. And uh, this has nothing to do with the message, but I stumbled across it, so I'm going to throw it out to you while we're... And you, it may be common knowledge to you, but I, I just never put it together before. But in this Nazarite vow, as we start reading here in a few minutes, there is an order to the way this vow takes place. And uh, so you, you first, you make a commitment, and as you make this commitment, there's some things that go along with it. And one of the obvious things about that vow is you would not cut your hair. And uh, so you would just allow your hair to grow, and it was a symbol to everybody around you that you have committed yourself to this vow. And so in some cases, it might would cause people not to offer you certain things because they would already know that you're under this vow. And uh, so at the end of this vow, the la very last part of this vow, what you would do is you would shave your head and you would take that hair and present it to the, to the priest at the end of that thing. And so that, that was a symbol that you have completed this vow and now you're going to yield it back. And uh, one, one thing that I read, it, it kind of illustrated that, that that hair was almost like the crown that the high priest would wear. I mean, it was a big deal. And so you, you give that back saying that this is completed. And isn't it interesting that whenever Samson yielded that hair, he didn't yield it to who he was supposed to. And whenever he yielded that, he also lost all his strength. And uh, so when, I don't know if God might have said, you know what, this old boy must be done with me. He must be given up now. And so I, I don't know, but I just thought that was pretty interesting as I was thinking about that and putting that together. And like I said, that may have been something that, you know, just very simple to you, but it just, I don't know, I just kind of thought that was interesting. And so in Numbers chapter number 6 and verse number 1, let's read these six verses right quick as we start talking about them. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow, a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. And he shall separate himself from wine, strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, uh, from the kernels even to the husk. And all the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, unto the day... Uh, be fulfilled in which he uh, separate, separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. And the day sh uh, that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall uh, not come to any dead body. And he shall not make himself unclean for his father or his mother, for his brother or for his sisters when they die, because uh, the consecration of his, of his God is upon his head. And all the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And so the whole point of this vow here is uh, you're going to do these things to make yourself holy unto God. Now here's a question. Is eating grapes a sin? But yet, by not eating these grapes, that was a process of becoming holy. And so grapes don't really mean that much to us today, but back in the day... When, in Numbers chapter number 6, when this is written, everything resolved, just revolved around grapes. Uh, literally, I mean, uh, you didn't drink Coca-Cola and Pepsi and sweet tea 
uh, you, you drank grape juice if you drank anything, or you drank water. And I don't know about y'all, but I get tired of drinking water. And uh, so I oftentimes drink other things just because I want something with some taste to it. And so by taking this vow and making that commitment, you're saying, you know what? I'm going to surrender the good things, and I'm going to surrender the blessings. And, and grapes and all that stuff is a, a sign of a blessing. You know, God had blessed them to be able to have these things, or you was just drinking water. And uh, I, I don't know if you've ever noticed before, but if you go quite some time and you just drink water, I mean, just straight up water, and then you drink some grape juice. And just, you know what you will notice? You will think, man, this stuff has got a lot of flavor to it. And the, the sugar or whatever in it will almost like affect you. Why? Because you, you've been missing that. And so you've been sacrificing and, and you haven't had that. And so then when you get it, it, it tastes so much stronger than what it did maybe the last time you had any. But the whole point being there is it's, it's something that you are doing as a sacrifice back to God to say, I'm acknowledging who God is and how great God is, and I'm going to yield myself and I'm going to sacrifice and not partake in this just as a symbol to God. That's what it was all about. And so the, these people, whenever they would uh, commit to this vow, the, they're not... They're not, not sinning now by not eating grape juice, or I mean by, by not eating grapes or not, not drinking the grape juice or nothing like that. It's just that they have made a commitment that, hey, I want God to realize how much He means to me, and so not only do, am I going to try to refrain from sinning, but I'm going to go another step, and I'm just going to sacrifice things that aren't even sins just so that I can be a little bit closer to God. Now, that's not where churches are today now, is it? You know where we live at today? We live at today where we try to find as many sins as we can and justify those sins and say that these things are okay now. Now, even though they weren't okay back then, but they're okay now. And, and, and so you know what we're gradually doing? We're gradually just getting farther and farther away from God. And so I'll just go ahead and just throw this out there and give it to you at the front of this. The whole point of this message is to try to get to a different place with God than we've ever been before. That's the whole point of this message. And so the message tonight is not about sin or anything else because if we get to the point of where we're really trying to get to a place with God that we've never been before, our focus is not going to be trying to justify sin. That's right. You know what? That won't even be in the scope. It won't even matter because when we're looking to God and we're trying to get closer to God, sin will not even be in that, in that section. And we won't even have to worry about is this right or is this wrong because when we're focused on getting closer to God, the, the sin and stuff like that, that's not even going to be an issue. We will be focusing on what can I surrender as a payment to God and how great He is. What can I sacrifice to allow Him to acknowledge how much I appreciate what He has done in my life and how much He's blessed me and what He's done for me. And so if we could get to that point, I really think it would transform church as we know it. It would transform our Christian life as we know it. Because society has brainwashed us into the whole philosophy of not getting closer to God, but how much can we do wrong and still be okay with God? That is now the whole thought process today. And so I'm not saying that we should act like Pharisees. I'm 100% against us acting like Pharisees. But I will say this, it doesn't hurt for us to go somewhere with God and do something with God that nobody else is doing without saying something to anybody else about it. Now, my mother, for instance, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've never seen my mother wear anything other than a dress or a skirt. Never. In my entire life. 37 years. And she, uh, she didn't get saved until she was in her 20s. But, uh, you know, from the time I was born till today, never seen her wear nothing outside of a dress or a skirt. Now, here's the other thing, too. I've never seen her say anything to anybody else about how they dress. And to the best of my understanding, she has made a covenant to God that that's, that's something that she just does for God. She don't do it for nobody else. Like, literally, she's not married, and there's nobody else lives in her house. She's not doing it for anybody else. She just does it for God. And you might think, well, that's silly. It's not a sin to wear other things. I, I mean, I truly don't think so. Some people would argue that, but I don't believe so. And uh, so... What she has done is she has said, you know, God means so much to me, and he's done so much in my life, 
then I'm going to surrender something to him. Just as not eating grapes seems pretty silly, don't it? I mean, that does. It just it sounds kind of silly that you're not going to eat grapes and that's going to make you closer to God. That seems kind of weird to me. And so she has made a vow or a covenant with God to say, you know what, this is the way that I'm going to live the rest of my days and I'm going to just do it for you, God. And so I want to ask you tonight, is there anything in your life that you have ever considered sacrificing for God that you don't have to sacrifice? Now, let that sink in for a minute and really think about that. Because where we live as Americans, we spend most of our time trying to figure out what sin that we can sacrifice and what sin we can keep. We're not really on the level of trying to figure out what kind of things are not sins that we could give back to God. We're trying to figure out what we can... Keep that our sins and him not just beat us over the head about it, right? right. Am I with you? Preacher, you know, we, we want to know how can we keep sinning? What sins can we continue to commit and God still bless us? That's where we live at in America. When where we should really be at is, hey, let's focus on getting so close to God that we start trying to figure out what could I just offer back to God and give back to him in honor and praise of his goodness and his grace in my life. Now, I have to say, man, I have been blessed beyond measure. Uh, if anybody wakes up feeling guilty in the mornings, it's me because of how good God's been to me. I mean, really, in all, in all kinds of areas of my life, I am so thankful for what God's done for me. And so I'm, I'm just humbled at the fact that God would be so good to somebody like me that's as sorry as I am. I, I don't understand it. But He chooses to do, and so it... It, it really convicts me about, well, what, what are you surrendering back to him when he surrendered so much to you? You know, when God's poured so much in your lap, what are you, what are you willing to give back to him? And so, as we, as we get into the message tonight, and uh, you, you can go ahead and be turning to 2 Samuel chapter number 23 right quick. 2 Samuel chapter 23. And I just want to reiterate the fact tonight that it really seems to me that when people have done this before, that the problem that I, that I see really come about was when somebody is willing to sacrifice and give something up for God, then they expect others around them to do the same thing. And to me, that, that completely distorts the whole point of what you're doing there. You know, if, if I choose by my own being, if I choose that, hey, I'm going to fast today, then I shouldn't get mad if my wife decides she's not going to. Why? Because if I'm doing this between me and God, then she don't have anything to do with it. And if Mariana wants to go in there and bake a pan of cookies, you know what? She ought to be able to do that because I'm the one that's supposed to be making the sacrifice, and it's not really a true sacrifice of my own self if I'm expecting others to sacrifice. And see, back in, the, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a group of guys that, man, they were all about sacrificing. And they, they wanted everybody to sacrifice everything. And, uh, I mean, it, it got down to just nonsense. And it destroyed a lot of people's lives because they, they took something and manipulated it and they used it in a way that God didn't anticipate it on being. No, nowhere do I see God implementing mass uh, vows on people to become Nazarites. Like, no, nowhere did he tell the whole nation of Israel, all right, this year everybody's got to be a Nazarite. It wasn't. God told Moses here, hey, you present this to people so that if they want to do something in a greater way for God, it gives them the opportunity. See, some of these things the high priest had to live by every day. So if you was going to be the high priest, this was your standard of living. And so... The only people that could be the high priest had to be one of Aaron's sons. You had to be a Levite, a descendant of Aaron. And so not everybody had the opportunity to be the high priest. And so God presented something so that these people could have an opportunity to, to live and, and sacrifice their self to God just as the high priest could. Now, that may not make sense to you or mean much to you, but that's actually a, a pretty big deal in the fact that God acknowledged the fact that being the high priest was a great opportunity, and so God says, you know what? I'm going to make an opportunity for everybody to be able to do something special 
for him. And so what that was, that was a, a special way of being able to do something for God. Now, uh, the first thing that I want to talk to you tonight is a sacrifice of worth. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter number 23 and verse number 15, if you, uh, if you got there, let's read uh, about three verses right here. And it says, And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, let me tell you this right quick. David has been fighting, been battling, and he's in a stronghold, and he's held up in that hold. And while he's there in that hold, he gets to... The thinking about the, the, the well at Bethlehem and, man, how, how good and how cold and how crisp that water was. And he's like, man, oh, if I just had some water from that place. Well, David had some men that are, were around him that were good men and they were mighty men. And so when they heard that David had a longing for something like that, you know what, they made it their job to think, you know what, let's make sure he gets him some of that. And so in verse number 16 it says, and, the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem. That was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof. But now look, it says, But poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of men that went in jeopardy for their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. And these things did the three mighty men. Now, here's the thing. When these men, when they brought this water back to David, it was just water, right? I mean, literally, if you could place a value, a, a, a normal value on that water, uh, even today with inflation, you can still buy a bottle of water for a buck, right? And so, we're, we're, what was in the cup, theoretically, wasn't really worth that much, was it? But David understood the worth of what those men's lives meant. Now, these were three mighty men. I don't know if you know much about David's mighty men. Every one of them guys was very valuable to David. And so those three men risked their lives and break through the hold of the Philistines. I mean, literally, fought through the Philistines to go get their captain, their king, some water that he had longed for. And so when they showed back up and he seen that, that wasn't just a cup of water to him. That was something of very great value because those men's lives were represented in that cup. And so now what's in that cup is not just a cup of water anymore, but it's of something of great value. And so David looks at that and he thinks, I'm not even worthy to drink of that cup. That's basically what he, he saw there. He didn't just see a cup of water now. He saw three men's lives and he said, I'm not even worthy to, to drink of these men's lives. And so then he takes that cup, and I don't know if he set up an altar or how he done it, but it says that he poured that out unto the Lord. And so David saw this as being something of great value, and he didn't see himself as being uh, you know, worthy to drink of it, and so he gave it to who he thought was worthy of it. And so he poured it out unto God. So let me ask you this question. When's the last time God gave you something that you didn't feel worthy of? When's the last time he gave you something that you felt like, man, I don't even deserve God to be this good to me? All right, here's the next thought. When, did, when have you thought about just giving that back to God? When have you thought, you know what, God, I'm not really worthy of this blessing in my life, and I would like to just offer it back to you? Now, look, I'm not trying to guilt you into doing anything. I'm just trying to change your mindset from what culture has been teaching us the last, uh, for me, the last 37 years. I've been brainwashed into a philosophy that uh, let's try to see what we can justify as sin and how much we can do and God still bless us instead of let's focus on the fact of how close to God could I really get. And if we start getting in that mindset, then we, then we don't start thinking about what sins we can commit and try to justify, then we start thinking about what can I just yield back to God? And look, I don't, whatever the case may be, but whatever in your life that God has done for you that's of great worth, are you offering that back to God? Look, for some of you, it might be some kind of financial blessing that God may have given you, and God may want you to pass it on to somebody else. He may not have gave it to you to keep. He may have just gave it to you to share with someone else. 
He may have gave you a talent that God intended for you to use for Him, but you've kept it for yourself. Now, I do construction, and so uh, I would hope that you would say that I'm talented at it. Uh, that's what I've spent my whole life around. And uh, so, even though God has given me that talent to make money, and that's how I earn a living, and that's what I do, you know what, I also try to find ways that, of asking God, how can I take this talent that I've been given, and how can you get honor out of it? Now look, I'm not trying to say that I do this every day. But on some days when I'm doing really good, I do try to do this. And so I do try to find times where I can try to do something to yield my talent back to God because He's given me something that's of great worth for me. Now, it may not be of great worth for everybody, but it's of great worth to me. And so what has God done in your life and what kind of blessings has God put in your life that can cause you to try to give something back to Him? Uh, Jennifer's mother, she was a nurse for, what, 40 years, 43 years, something like that. And uh, so on several occasions, now that she's retired, uh, she will uh, sign up. She pays the money. Nobody pays it for her. She pays the money, and she will fly to some third world country that's in all kinds of shambles, and she will spend a week, two weeks over there sweating it out, working in like a sweatshop over there uh, doing nursing work. And so she'll assist doctors, and they'll do surgeries and all that kind of stuff. And she pays the money to go, and she spends her time to be there. And you know why she does that? She does that because that is something that's of worth that God has given to her, and she has found a way to give that back to Him. Amen. And I would say that God very much honors that. Yeah. And so I, I don't know what you're thinking about tonight, but I ask you to concentrate and think about what... What has God blessed you with? What has God given you that may not be so much just for you, but something that God's given you to be able to be used for Him to bless somebody else? And I promise you that God's, God's done that for all of us. Uh, you know, I mean, if we lived in, in some other places, I might would question you, you know, and say, yeah, you might be right. Maybe God hadn't done that much for you. But man, we're living in a place where we're like the most blessed people in the world and in history. And so God has done something in your life, and God has blessed you with some great things, and I'm sure you can find a way to be able to give back to Him. Uh, it may not necessarily be an opportunity of a talent, of a ability that God has given you, but you never know, God, there may be something that you are going to purchase or something that you're going to buy, and God give it to you at a great discount so that you could afford to maybe help somebody or do something else with that money that He could get honor and glory out of. Now, I mean, if we could all be real honest, when we catch a deal on something, we're not normally thinking about how we can take that money and give it to somebody else, are we? Normally, we've already got something else we can spend that money on. But see, that's the difference between focusing on what sins can I get by with and still be blessed by God, or how can I really get focused in on God and just see God and let everything else fade away. <clears throat> and so I, I really... You know, you, you, you preach some, uh, you, know, you preach a lot of messages and, and they all affect you. But this one's been a little weightier on me than any other message, just in the simple fact that if I could get a hold of this truly myself, then it would take me to a whole different spiritual platform with God. Because it causes you to start seeing uh, your life in a completely different way, where it's the, the, the whole focus is not about yourself, but it makes the focus back on God. And whenever God does something in your life, you see it as God doing something in your life and not you being lucky. How often do we use that term? Well, man, I was, I was lucky. You know, I got really lucky on that deal. I mean, we've all been guilty of that. And so if we could change our focus and see that God, God may be working in a mightier way in our life than what we even realize. Uh, oftentimes, if you watch an artist paint a picture, while they're painting that picture... Like, you can know what they're painting, and you still can't figure it out, right? And wouldn't you say that God is the greatest artist that's ever been? And I would say that God is painting a lot of things in our life, and we can't see it just because we don't see like He sees. And so oftentimes God does things in our life that we don't see it as what God intended just because we don't see like He sees. 
And so God's trying to get us to see the bigger picture when so often we're so tonal focused on ourselves that we don't really see what God was doing there. And so when God dumps a blessing in your life, uh, are, you, are you looking to see how that, that blessing can be an opportunity for Him? Or do you just see that as God doing something for you? And you just take it and absorb it all yourself? Uh, the second thing, if you'll turn over to 1 Samuel chapter number 1. 1 Samuel 1. In 1 Samuel chapter number 1 here, you've got Hannah, and Hannah, uh, she had went to make sacrifices with her husband, and uh, she was barren, couldn't have any children, and so she goes down here to make sacrifices, and she prays and pours her heart out to God. Literally pours her heart out to God. And so as she prays, she is praying out of a want. Not necessarily a need, she's praying out of a want. And so here we find uh, Hannah, she offers a sacrifice of want. And so right here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 1, verse number 11, look at this. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And so here, Hannah, she makes a vow to God. Hey, God, if you will just give me this child that I earnestly want so bad, then I'll just turn around and give it back to you. Now, that almost doesn't even make sense, does it? Like, if she wants this child so bad, why won't she just give it right back to God? But that's what she does. She focuses on the fact that, God, if you will just bless me, then I will, I will just give him back to you. Now, here's the interesting thing. You realize in order for her to give him back to, to God, like she said, she took him back up to the tabernacle and dropped him off. She didn't move in at the tabernacle. I don't know how far she lived away from there, but it talks about how they would come yearly for the feast, and so it sounds like that maybe they lived a long ways away. Maybe she couldn't swing by the tabernacle every day. And so, but here's the thing, is she had a great want, and so she told God, she said, if you will give me this great want that, that I'm desiring so badly, then I'll just yield it back to you. Now, here's two parts in this thing. For one, Samuel ended up not being her only child. If I remember right, I think she ended up having six other children, and, uh, which is a really big deal. And so she made a commitment to God, said, I'm going to give this to God. And so God gave it to her. She gives it back to God, and then God pours out a major blessing in her life. But that's not even the, the whole part of it. The thing is, is by her giving Samuel back to God, caused Samuel's life to be lived out in such a way that there is no way it would have been the same if she would have kept him. Samuel became the high priest over Israel and probably one of the most revered men in the Bible. And he did some mighty and great things. And he, he was such a great man that if he came into town unannounced, people were worried on why he was even there. <laughs> why? Because he had such a great presence with God. And all that happened because Hannah was able to give and sacrifice her want. Now, let me ask you this. How many of us all have children, and we say, yeah, I'm giving them to God. I'm, I'm sacrificing them back to God. God can have their life. But we put a contingency at the end of that, and God can only use them as long as they stay within 30 minutes of us. How about that? I mean, i got two daughters. The likelihood of them staying close to me is slim to none. But you know what I would rather have more than them living next door to me? Is I would rather have them in some third world country living dirt poor, honoring God with their life than anything else they could possibly do. If they were living in a mansion beside me driving a Bentley, uh, but away from God, um, is nowhere near as good of a blessing as if they could be on the other side of the world honoring God with their life. And look, the only way there's a chance of that even happening is I've got to be willing now to sacrifice my wants.
so that God can get what he wants out of them. Now, if God chooses to bless me in a great way by doing that, that's all well and good, but he's not obligated to. God wasn't obligated to give Hannah any great blessing when she gave to him. You know what that is? That's not really giving if that's your intentions. It's not really a sacrifice if you're expecting something a whole lot more in return. That's not sacrifice. And so the thought here tonight is for us to be willing to sacrifice something great without an expect of return. And on the whole point, to just to honor God and to get to a special place with God that maybe we'd never been before. And so Samuel was able to, to do great things for God all because his mother sacrificed her want. She gave up that son that she so desired and so longed for, and by doing so, it caused something great to happen in his life. Now, if you will, turn over to Esther chapter number 4. Esther chapter number 4. <clears throat> Esther, many of you are probably familiar with, but Esther, uh, she was an orphan. She was raised by her uncle, Mordecai. And uh, so her parents, we, we don't really know what all happened to them, but they're obviously not there. And uh, so she's just an orphan. Well, as time rolls on, the, the king gets rid of the queen and banishes Vashti and gets rid of her. And so he calls for all the young maidens to come and he's going to pick him out a new queen. And so Esther goes from being an orphan to being the queen. Now that's a pretty drastic difference, isn't it? I mean, literally, going from just not having anything to having everything. And that's the life that that took place in Esther's life. But here the problem is, there was uh, this turnabout that came, and all the Jews had been threatened with their life, except for one. Guess who wasn't threatened by this commandment? It was Esther. She's the only one that was going to escape it. And so the only one that was going to escape it was the only one that could do anything about it. And so we find here where Esther has to sacrifice her will. And I don't know about y'all, but man, that's really hard to do sometimes, isn't it? And so, right here in Esther chapter number 4, and verse number 16, it says, uh, this is Esther sending a commandment back to Mordecai. She says, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, and I and also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. And so Esther has to surrender her will here. And so the deal is, is she's, she's not supposed to go in before the king without being requested. And Mordecai is saying, you've got to go talk to the king. You've got to get something done about this. We're all going to die except for you. And so the, the orphan now queen has to be willing to give up her comfortable seat because now she's going to be exposing herself and she could be liable to be getting killed also. And so as she uh, sacrifices her will, she don't want to do this. She goes before the king and petitions the king to let the king know that, hey, uh, these people that you're about to kill, man, this is all wrong. And she explained the whole deal to, to the king, and he accepted it, and the, the man that needed to be killed was killed. But she didn't know that outcome going into it. And so let me ask you this tonight. What are you willing to sacrifice of your, <clears throat> of your worth, of your want, and of your will? What, what are you willing to sacrifice of those things? Are you willing to sacrifice of all of those things? Now, I'm not saying that you have to do these things because the Nazarite vow was not for everybody. The Nazarite vow, it was for somebody wanting to go farther with God than what everybody else was doing. And so look, if you're just coming to play church tonight, no, you're probably not going to do any of those things. You're probably not going to consider any of those things. But if you want to get to know God in a special way, in a closer way, then by doing these things, it can cause you to see God and know God in a special way that everybody else doesn't get to see God and know God in. The interesting thing about all those guys that you can find in the Bible that did do that Nazarite vow at one time or another, they all did some wild and crazy things. God did some things through them that was not of their own strength, it was of God's doings. And so, 
Um, Brother uh, James, if you will, throw that last slide up there. <clears throat> so now, here's the real, the real kicker in the whole scheme of things, is oftentimes we're holding on to things that we've got no business holding on to. And we hold on to these things, and then by us just holding on to them, it actually ends up just making a mess out of things. When if we just give it to God, it could be much more. Now, I'm not, not really a tree expert or anything like that, but the, this thing up here on the screen here is called a strangler fig. Anybody ever heard of one of them? So a strangler fig, the way they work is uh, as a seed hatches or, uh, you know, whether it's a bird or some type of something will, will pick this seed up and it will drop it on a tree limb somewhere. And this, this fig will start to grow out of the seed. And as it starts to grow, it'll, it'll grow down the tree. And then it'll root down into the ground around the tree. And then it'll start to grow around that tree. And before you know it, this thing has just encompassed the tree. And it encompasses it to such a point that it starts constricting the tree. And as it grows its foliage, its leaves and all on there, it takes all the sunlight away from that tree. And it, inadvertently, what this fig ends up doing is it strangles the tree to death. And so it has attached itself to this tree, and it grows around it, and then finally the end result is it just kills the tree. And so let me ask you this. There's a possibility that God has put some things into your life that if you're not careful and you're not willing to yield it back to God, then you may just destroy the blessing that God's given you. Because, see, what happens is, you know, it, the fig seed doesn't pick where it lands. Um, you know, the animals are involved in that process. And can I say, in your life, you don't always get to pick circumstances in your life, and you don't get to pick the way things play out in your life. And it may cause things to take place in your life that you would not prefer to take place, but the end result could end up causing you to be the one that ends up destroying something good. And if we look at everything that God's given us in our life as it just being ours, more than likely what we're going to do is constrict it until we end up causing it just to rot and not be a blessing anymore. Now, if you're a car guy, like, you know, I mean, I'm not super avid, but I appreciate muscle cars and stuff like that. And you know what many of people have done in history is they would go buy a very very unique hot rod. Like in 1957, whenever 1957, when the Chevy Bel Air come out, that was actually people that went and bought those cars, drove them home or had them trailered home and put in a garage. I even knew of one where a guy bought two of them. He bought one that was a fuel injection, one that was not a fuel injection, and had them taken to his house, put in the basement, and then they took the garage doors out and framed them in to where those cars could not be taken out. And until that man died, those cars never moved. So you know what they did in there? Sat there and rot. Something that everybody else would have appreciated. Sat in there and just rotted. Uh, just recently, just a few years ago, Ford came out with a new um, uh, GT, um, I can't remember if they called it the GT or just the GT 500 or something like that. But back in the 60s, they made a GT40, and it was a European uh, race car. Is what you know? We won the Le Mans with that. We like I worked for Ford, but the Americans won, and uh, so they designed that car just to win the Le Mans. And so they done it. They they sent it over there, and it beat everybody. And then we left like the arrogant Americans we are. And uh, so we didn't go back for quite some time. You know what they did? They designed a new Ford GT. And so you know what we did again. We took it back over to Europe again just to stomp them, just to let them know that we can still do it. And then, but they made so many of those cars each year. And here's the requirement for you to have one of those cars. Now, you have to pay a handsome price to even get one. I mean, it's like a half a million dollars for one of them cars. And here's the requirement. The requirement is you have to have that car in the public eye. You are not allowed to buy that car and park it in your garage and leave it for a collector. And if you do that, Ford will sue you for doing that when you paid them for the car. And you know why? They want that car to affect other people. 
They want that car to have a presence around other people. And so look, God has put some blessings in your life and God has done some things in your life and He doesn't want you to just wrap that thing or just wrap yourself around that thing and hold it in and make it just a blessing for yourself. God wants you to cause that blessing to be a blessing on others. And the only way we can do that sometimes is we've got to take our hands off of it. And can I say that it, sometimes it's really hard to take our hands off of things. Sometimes you've got to be willing to take your hands off your children. Or you may have to be willing to take your hands off your husband or your wife so that they can be a blessing and be used the way God intended them to be used. And if we're not careful, the blessings that God's put in our life, we will cause to rot and start to break down because we don't give them the place that God intended them to have. Samuel's life could have played out completely different if Hannah was a different type of mother. Let me ask you this, what if you were Hannah's mama? I mean, if you were Samuel's mama. Could Samuel have reached his potential by you being his mother? If you were Samuel's daddy, now, Samuel's daddy had a part in that too. He had to be willing to give that boy up too. And so look, if you were Samuel's daddy, would your Samuel turn out the same way? Or would you add a different kind of Samuel? Now look, I'm not going to belabor the service tonight. That's the message. God, God has been so good to us, and He's blessed us in so many ways. We live in a day of grace where we don't live under the strict requirements of the Old Testament. We don't live under that, that, that tough Levitical law as they did. But yet those people that lived under such a tough law obviously had a desire to do something greater for God in order for God to even make that available. And so now that we live in such freedom and, and such relaxation, you would almost see it as, what are you willing to sacrifice back to God? Miss Leslie, if you don't mind, if you'll come on to the piano. And so, what are you willing to sacrifice for God? Are you willing to sacrifice some of your worth or some of your want or some of your will or maybe a little bit of all those things so that God can know how much you appreciate what He's done for you? Look, if you're focused on what sins you can get away with or if you want to argue about what's sin and what's not sin, you ain't even thinking on the same page as this. And I'm not trying to talk down to nobody. I'm just saying that if, you're, if you spend your day trying to figure out what kind of sins you can get away with, then your mind's nowhere even close to this. But I can promise you this much. If you could get your mind onto this, you would start seeing that there, God has put so many more blessings in your life than what you'd even recognize. So many more blessings than what you'd even recognize. And so what's probably taking place in your life is God is pouring all these blessings in your life and you're not even seeing it and giving God the credit for it because you think it's all about you and you think it's all for you. And so if you all stand, uh, if, if you'd like to come pray and, and just pour your heart out to God tonight, I, I encourage you, just, just be honest and, and just yield to God whatever you're willing to yield to Him.